Hello, welcome back. In this video, I'm going to talk about the land reforms in China, which took place in the 1940s and the very early 1950s. This is an example of radical communism. That's one of the three kinds of communism that the historian David Priestland talks about. So radical communism is characterized by stirring people up with excitement to mobilize them to achieve certain revolutionary aims. Generally, these aims are related to bringing about a new kind of society. This being communism, this kind of society is ideally going to be one which is very equal and where people aren't being exploited by other people who have more power than they do. And people as a collective have control over their own lives and their own destinies. And the point is that it's the people themselves that are participating actively in bringing this new society about. It's not like they're sitting around waiting for the government to do everything for them. So what happened during the land reforms in China is that the Communist Party sent work teams into the countryside, into the villages, and they set up what they called poor peasant associations. And then it was the job of these associations to talk to everyone in the village and try to identify the class position of everyone in the village. In other words, who was poor, who was rich, who was in the middle, and most importantly, who were the landlords? In other words, who was making money by charging rents to the people who were using that land? For the Communist Party, this whole campaign was part of their strategy to try to bring about an equal society. So what they were actually trying to do was wipe out the entire landlord class. And also what they wanted to do was redistribute this land so that later when they tried to put into practice their plans for collectivizing agriculture, that was easier to do because they didn't have a landlord class to try to stop them doing it. For many people, particularly the poorer villagers, they were very supportive of these land reforms because it really benefited them. They were very happy that they were no longer going to be indebted to these rich landlords and also that they were no longer going to be taken advantage of by money lenders who had been profiting off their, their situation, off their hardship. And they were of course very happy that when the work teams had confiscated property from the landlords, it was being shared out to them. On the other hand, sometimes the job of the work teams was quite difficult because when they got to these villages, it wasn't very clear who was the landlord or who was just a slightly richer villager. Sometimes there was no clear landlord. And in some cases, in order to carry out the political task of what they had to do, they simply had to select someone who perhaps looked slightly richer than everyone else, call that person the landlord and then carry out their campaign, even though that person probably wasn't really the owner of most of the land. In some areas of China, the land reform campaigns were really quite extreme and very violent. And these landlords or supposed landlords would be dragged in front of a crowd and they held what they called struggle sessions where the landlord was supposed to publicly confess to their crimes while the crowd hurled abuse and insults at them. And they were very often subjected to all kinds of violence and they were very often sentenced to death and killed. And in some cases, these struggle sessions were so violent that the Communist Party actually had to try to rein the villagers back in because they'd actually gone much further than they had originally intended. But in other areas of China, these campaigns didn't actually have very much momentum behind them because, for example, sometimes the landlords were relatives of the other villagers or members of the same clan. And so the other villagers were quite unwilling to denounce them and beat them up and take their property off them. And in some places, the wealthiest villagers or the landlords were also supporters of the Communist Party and might also be funding them. So those landlords tended to be left alone. There's a very interesting book by a scholar called Brian Demur 
called Landlords, and he gives really vivid accounts of these campaigns and gives a very good description of how complex they were. He talks about how the efforts of the Communist Party to try to mobilize people to take part in these campaigns were very much bound up with warfare of various kinds that was going on at the same time. If you remember from the other video, radical communism is very often bound up with uh, an external or internal threat or enemy which helps to drive this mobilization of people. Because during the 1940s, the earlier part of the land reform campaign, the whole of China was embroiled in a civil war between the communists and the nationalists. And the nationalists were pro-capitalist, very different from the Communist Party. And so it was very easy to assume that landlords were going to be natural allies of the Nationalist Party. So attacks on the landlords came to be considered part of the civil war, part of the struggle against the nationalists, as well as part of a class struggle. Then to make things even more complicated, in 1950, China entered the Korean War. So that's a civil war going on inside Korea with China on one side and the Americans, who are also capitalist, of course, backing the other side. So then attacks on landlords comes to be associated with attacks against the imperialists who of course may or may not threaten to invade China at any time as far as the communists were concerned. So whether or not landlords actually were allies of imperialists or allies of the nationalists, you can see how these attacks on landlords had sort of symbolically many layers to it as far as a strategy to try to mobilize villagers in support of this revolutionary land reform campaign. And this is really how radical communism works in practice. So in the violence of the campaigns, many landlords lost their lives, although actually most of them, after confessing to their crimes or their supposed crimes, were allowed to live and they were very often given a small plot of land for themselves. And the landlord class in China was pretty much wiped out by 1952. In the next video, I will talk about another example of radical communism in China, and that is the Great Leap Forward. Thank you for watching.